given the level of agitation that is beginning to bubble in society, I don't think it's a coincidence that we have a Seventh-day Adventist on the national stage, do you? That's just me. Well, as we think about religious liberty, we have a special guest with us today, <clears throat> Dr. Ed Cook, who graduated from Baylor University in 2012 with a PhD in church state studies. So this has been, this has been a, a subject of great interest, obviously, to Dr. Cook for some time. But he has served as the public affairs and the religious liberty director for three years for the conference. He pastors the Waco English and the Waco Spanish churches, and he also told me that he speaks a little bit of Russian and a little bit of Romanian. <coughs> so he's quadrilingual, and maybe a few others I don't know about. But uh, he has written many articles on religious liberty in Liberty Magazine. He is also going to leave with me a book, which is his doctoral dissertation. And it is titled Roman Catholic Hegemony and Religious Freedom. This is his doctoral dissertation. He also has a DVD that he is going to leave with me. It's called Modern Roman Catholicism and Religious Freedom. He has another DVD that he's going to leave as well. But all three of these items he will leave with me. And if you would like to purchase one, um, you can see me anytime that you want after the Sabbath. Um, and you can purchase any one of these items. But Dr. Cook, we're glad to have you here in Conroe. <laughs> that uh, you wanted to give me so much time for the sermon that you were ready to exit. <laughs> Please pray with me. Our Father in heaven, today we thank you that we have this opportunity to worship you on the Sabbath day to recognize you as our creator, God, to recognize ourselves as your creation that is needy and worthy of your grace. We ask, Lord, that you would bless us during this service today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I'd like to thank your pastor and all of you uh, as a congregation for giving me this opportunity to be here with you. And as your pastor has shared with you a little bit about uh, just a brief intro or background uh, regarding my education and the work that I have been doing, uh, during these three years that I've served as the conference religious liberty director, I've had an opportunity to speak one Sabbath per month in churches, uh, most of the churches uh, throughout the Texas conference field. And in a few cases, I've been invited outside of the Texas conference. And on those occasions, I've had the opportunity to deal with uh, or discuss issues of religious freedom, prophetic events. And one of the most important things I think that this position gives me the opportunity to do is to share with our church members, in essence, what your rights are. Um, as we look at the screen, and uh, I've got a presentation that actually uh, we can go through that. I'll give them a moment to drop the screen so you can see it. <clears throat> but the introduction that I'm going to be looking at is, is briefly reviewing a little bit of the work that I do in the field of, of uh, public affairs and religious liberty. During the close to three years that I have served in this capacity, uh, with God's grace, we've managed to help uh, approximately 50 Seventh-day Adventists uh, that out of those 50 cases... There have been 45 that have been worked out successfully where those individuals have been able to keep the Sabbath and also keep their job or pursue their educational studies. Um, primarily the two areas of, that we find in the field of religious freedom <clears throat> that I have been involved in, and if we can go to the next slide, please, uh, the next presentation. One more. There we go. Uh, in the introduction that I'm sharing with you now, uh, there's primarily two areas that Seventh-day Adventists find themselves in the need of assistance or intervention on behalf of the conference. Uh, typically, it's either in the area of their work environment, uh, where their employer is obligating them to come into work on the Sabbath day, or if it's a student, there are times when there are student uh, activities planned by a university 
or a high school that obligate our students to violate the Sabbath day. And in those two areas, with God's blessings and grace, we've managed to help uh, our church members be able to keep the Sabbath day holy. And at the same time, they have been able to serve as a witness in their work environment or in their educational environment. Uh, so I really I always tell people that actually this is God's ministry. It's not mine. Uh, he simply works through me to meet the needs of our, our people throughout the field of the state of Texas. Uh, just to give you a brief example of that, uh, about a month ago, there was an individual living in, San, San, uh, in the San Antonio area that he had difficulty with his work uh, where they had given him the Sabbath off for a whole year, and then they had a change of supervisors, and they started obligating him to come into work on the Sabbath. He immediately got in touch with me, and through a letter that I wrote, they managed to work th everything out perfectly fine, uh, where he had no more issues at, at his workplace. Uh, one of my own church members at the English church in Waco, uh, recently he and his wife had taken Bible studies over the course of a year. They ended up accepting the Sabbath and were soon to be baptized, but he wanted to work things out in his work environment so he could have the Sabbath off each week. And up to that time, they had been giving him the Sabbath off, but again, with a change of supervisors, they started uh, asking him to come in to work on Saturdays. And even before I was able to write the letter and send it, the following week, he told me, he said, hey, <clears throat> Pastor Cook, guess what? I've got good news. And I said, well, tell me about it. He said, I talked to my employers, and they said, well, it certainly is a, a, an issue of conflict because the current position that you have requires you to come in and work on Saturdays, and you're asking to have the Sabbath off. So the only solution that we see as a company is to promote you to a higher position better pay, and it's a job that doesn't require you to come in on Saturdays. So God worked all of that out, and I didn't even have to write a letter. I just prayed for him, and uh, God took the situation into his own hands. So God is certainly faithful to honor those of us that honor him. Amen? If we can go to the next slide, please, the next part of it. Uh, so dealing in the area of public affairs and religious liberty, that's a lot of the work that I do. Part of what I do is also along educational lines, uh, like on this Sabbath, I'm taking time to share with all of you a little bit more, not only about your rights, but also about our foundational beliefs as Seventh-day Adventists as it relates to religious freedom. Uh, you can also uh, notice there the things that your pastor mentioned, some of the educational materials that I have. Um, I make these items available not to earn money. Uh, I get my pay as working as a pastor. Uh, I give these seminars for free. I don't charge for them except just for mileage costs. Uh, and so I make these items available for church members at greatly reduced prices that basically simply covers the overhead to uh, make the books and the DVDs available. Um, the other DVD that your pastor had referred to that I, I brought with me, I didn't bring a copy in uh, to give to him to show you this morning. But for example, it's uh, 22 hours of material that's only $25. Uh, so you won't find uh, that kind of items on sale frequently. Uh, that contain well-prepared pre Adventist material. Uh, also, I would like to just encourage all of us to recognize the work of religious freedom is not something that is just uh, relegated to our Adventist attorneys or lawyers. The work of defending and proclaiming and promoting religious freedom is actually something that is a responsibility that rests upon each of us, not only to financially, uh, support our religious liberty during the Liberty Campaign at, during January, February, and March of every year. But in addition to that, every one of us makes a decision to either uphold the banner of freedom or to drop it in the dust whenever we are faced with the challenge of observing the Sabbath faithfully or not observing it. And some of our members, unfortunately, due to pressure at work, sometimes due to pressure from family, or from pe pressure from their peers in, a, in an edu educational environment, unfortunately, some of our members yield to that pressure and uh, basically feel that for a couple of Sabbaths, they can go ahead and go to work or take an exam uh, one Sabbath a month. It's okay if they go in and work on that day, but then have the other Sabbaths off, or on occasion to make arrangements with their employer to work on a Friday night. And they feel that you know God is not there with a thunderbolt to strike them dead, obviously. Uh, we don't live under the Old Testament theocracy when people were stoned for breaking the Sabbath day. 
like they still do in some parts of Israel, by the way, in uh, the modern context. Uh, they have what they call Sabbath uh, vigils, where they have individuals that are dressed in pure black in some of the communities in Israel today. And if they see people violating the Sabbath day, they start to stone them. Uh, so that's something that still happens in the modern era in the country of Israel and some of their smaller uh, cities uh, that are out in the outlying skirts, outskirts of the larger cities. But we as Adventists don't follow those rules. Uh, that's part of the Old Testament uh, guidelines for keeping the Sabbath holy and sacred to God. So based on that, church members today in the modern context oftentimes think, well, you know, I really need the job, I've got to pay bills, or I need to get my education, I need to earn this degree, and if I just take this one exam one time on the Sabbath day, nobody's going to be the wiser, I don't show up at church, they think I'm sick, etc., so forth. But God keeps a record of those things. And I would like to suggest to all of us that the most important record that we want to pursue and desire to obtain is heaven's record, where God can say on his register, right, attendance at church, unless it's due to health reasons or some emergency, medical emergency. But otherwise, God can check off and say, by the name of Pastor Ed Cook, faithful Sabbath observance week by week. And uh, I'm here in the school of Jesus because that's what church should be. Uh, we're actually, we come here to participate in Sabbath school. We participate in the worship service. And with God's blessings and guidance, we pray that we can receive some kind of blessing and instruction through the sermon. So really, Sabbath, every Sabbath day, is God's day, the school of Christ, where every one of us that are members are enrolled in that school, and he seeks to teach us about the kingdom of heaven. Amen? We can go to our next slide, please. I'd like to invite you to open your Bibles, if you haven't already, to Revelation chapter 14, verse 6. By the way, uh, as I was seating, sit, uh, seated there with your pastor, I asked him, I said, uh, roughly what time should I consider an uh, end point for the sermon? He said, you're, until you're finished. Uh, but I'm not going to take all of that time. Uh, we're going to cover some key points and with God's blessings look at primary things, three primary things that we're going to be looking at uh, dealing in Revelation 14, 6. Dealing with the missiological focus of religious freedom and the three angels' messages. Dealing with the Christological focus and the eschatological focus. The missiological focus, as you can see there on the screen, missio is dealing with the, is the Greek term translated into English as the mission, the mission focus of the church. We find that in Revelation 14, 6, John tells us that this other angel that he saw flying in the midst of heaven had the everlasting gospel to take, all of the, to, to, to take to all of those who dwell upon the earth, to every nation, kindred, tribe, tongue, and people. So with that understanding, we as Seventh-day Adventists recognize that the world field is where God has called us to share the gospel. Now, what is interesting is that at the beginning of our movement, way back in the 1840s through roughly the 1860s, Seventh-day Adventists, the pioneers of our movement that lived here in America, they believed that their mission territory was the United States. They did not have a global vision until as they began studying Bible prophecy more and as God gave vi further visions to Ellen White, there was one particular vision where she saw the earth and as it was rotating, she said that she saw little spots of light begin to appear in different locations until eventually all of those little spots of light covered the whole earth. And she said that God had revealed to her, based on this text, Revelation 14, 6, that the purpose that God had raised up the Seventh-day Adventist church was in a time of apostasy, spiritual apostasy across the board among different religious organizations, not only Christian but other non-Christian groups. God prophetically had predicted that he would raise up a movement, not just a church, but a movement blessed by his Holy Spirit, founded upon the Word of God, and that would have the mission of teaching not just people living in America, but people living around the globe about the Creator God and the need to worship Him on the Sabbath day. So with that understanding, and basing it on Revelation 14, 6, and the vision that God gave to her, Ellen White began to communicate that message to the leaders of our church, and that is when we began to start studying and, and strategizing about how to send missionaries, 
first to Europe, then to Australia, then into Africa, Central and South America, and countries around the world. And so that today we can actually say that out of the 240 some odd countries officially recognized by the United Nations, the Seventh-day Adventist Church has entered all but five of those countries. Amen? So with God's blessings, we've been doing missionary work very aggressively, seeking to reach people in all countries. And even, by the way, uh, you can go to a country like India, and you will find that they have over 400 dialects, uh, languages, uh, besides the main languages that they speak there. In China, you can go there, and I think it's over 400 or 500 different dialects that you'll find in China. Central and South America, there's a variety of uh, other dialects as well, not just Spanish. Uh, so these are things that we as Adventists have individuals who feel called by God to dedicate their time and their effort to studying those dialects to be able to reach those particular people groups and not just say we have a certain number of churches in India, but actually to say we've taken the Seventh-day Adventist, the three angels messages, and we've actually reached a particular people group in their own dialect. So with that kind of work that is still before us, uh, there is the need for individuals still to continue go out, going out and doing missionary work. Uh, nowadays, we can say that we have managed to reach these major continents so that we actually have individuals from those countries that have their local natives that are Seventh-day Adventist leaders in the work there, that they're actually sending missionaries back to America. Um, one of the unfortunate things, and I think uh, all of us, we, we should realize this if we don't already, America, year by year, is reaching a point where we're losing our spirituality and our Judeo-Christian Judeo foundation and heritage. Um, that is why nowadays there's more and more of the younger generation that you can ask them, show them pictures of Noah and Moses and individuals like Jesus, and they really don't know who they are. You can ask them questions about the Bible, and they're not very familiar with it, uh, like old, older generations where those individuals would take the time and, and study thoroughly, memorizing Bible verses and so forth. Now, I'm speaking generally. Uh, there are some of our schools and some of our churches where you can find young people that they're right on top of uh, Scripture, and they can quote it backwards and forwards. And we praise God for individuals that do that. Um, they show that they're getting A's in the school of Jesus, right? Some of the other things, though, that we need to look at regarding this aspect of Revelation 14.6 and the, what's stated there about the angel, uh, the angelos is the Greek term that can be translated as messenger or uh, literally an angel of God. Based on the fact that the Seventh-day Adventist Church and this movement is something that is raised up by God, God easily could have sent angels to take this message to other human beings. But God chose to engage us as human beings, that as we receive Christ as Lord and Savior, we become a link in the chain let down from heaven that is designed to reach our fellow human beings, humanity. Um, something I would include uh, regarding this that I would like to share that I think is vitally important. There will not be a single individual in heaven there will not be a single individual in heaven who has not, in some form or fashion, become the means to reach at least one other soul. Whether it's giving a Bible study, preaching an evangelistic meeting or crusade, sharing a loaf of bread with your neighbor, mowing your neighbor's lawn when they're sick or have a broken leg, doing something to interest and reach one person to lead them to Christ. The reason I state that is that the Bible teaches plainly that every individual who is truly converted becomes an agency through which God works to reach another individual. Um, it's kind of like the proverb that says, you basically, uh, you, you know one if you have been one, right? Uh, if we know Christ as our personal Savior, we can share Jesus with other people. So it's vitally important that we, recognizing that, also recognize that the only true way that we can maintain our spiritual growth and our love for Christ is somehow sharing Jesus with others. Um, the challenge that we as a church, we oftentimes face is that we reach people for Christ, 
They come into the church, and by the way, if they don't make within the first four to five weeks, if they don't make at least seven friendships within the church, they stand a good risk of eventually falling away from the church and losing interest, um, not understanding all of the in-house language that we use as Adventists, um, not understanding some of our practices, and basically getting discouraged and then falling away from the church. So one of the things that during my seminars that I always like to share with our churches wherever I preach, if you're not currently actively involved in some way trying to reach somebody for Christ, whether it's part of a prayer group, just praying for your community, or praying for those other church members that are going out to give Bible studies, it can be as simple as doing that. Something as simple as handing out a piece of literature uh, out on the street corner or inviting somebody to church inviting them to vacation Bible school. But if we are not actively doing that, then I'd like to encourage each of our members to take time to reflect on that and ask God to make changes in your life so that you would become part of the channel of God's grace and God's love to reach people for Jesus. And I would like to suggest to you that if you haven't done that, and at the moment that you begin to experience that, you will find a completely new Christian walk that you have for your own self. Uh, you'll find a greater love for the Lord, a greater openness to God's leading, a uh, better understanding of God's word, and becoming more active in sharing Christ with others. The greatest joy that I have had as a pastor have been the occasions when I've been able to lead somebody into the baptistry and uh, baptize them and recognize that, uh, who am I, right? A sinful human being that needs God's grace. But God has been able to work through me to touch somebody's heart and interest them in Christ and lead them to baptism. And then to see the joy that they have in sharing, wanting to share Christ with others, the newfound faith that they have uh, coming out of all of the darkness of superstition. In fact, currently I'm studying with uh, an individual in the Spanish church. His name is Jose, Jose Rocha, and uh, with his family. And they told me, they said, Pastor, before we learned about, uh, as you've studied with us now, about what the Bible teaches regarding hell, we used to think that as soon as people died and they were lost, they would go down to the pit of hell and they would be tortured there. And whatever their major sin was, that was the thing that they were also tormented with. Uh, they said that if somebody that was accustomed to stealing, that in hell that they were put there and whatever little possessions they had on a daily basis, somebody would steal things from them. So these were things, that was their concept that they had until they learned what the Bible taught about that. So there are a multitude of people that are still in the darkness of superstition and lack of Bible knowledge that even Ellen White tells us in The Great Controversy that those multitudes are wistfully, wistfully looking to heaven and in heartfelt prayers are asking that God would send somebody to open the scriptures to them and help them to understand the way of salvation. Now, another little thing I'll share with all of you uh, is part of the seminars that I do like to, that I give. Uh, they say that statistically, whatever the size of a congregation is, you can expect that 10% of that congregation will have the spiritual gift of being able to go out and actually give Bible studies or engage in preaching the gospel. Uh, so, pastor, you have a congregation of about how many here? 200 roughly, maybe 225. Okay, so if I were to ask those of you that have an interest in giving Bible studies, we would expect to have at least 20 of uh, the group of you that are here that would raise hand, your hand or maybe come forward and indicate that if you're maybe already giving Bible studies or you have a desire to learn how to give Bible studies, uh, that would be how God would be leading this church to use your spiritual gifts to share Christ with others and grow this church. Uh, so at the end of the sermon, I'll be asking you to to respond in that fashion. Um, the other part of it, though, some of you that may not feel gifted to give Bible studies, but you feel gifted to organize into a prayer group to pray for those that will go out to give Bible studies, you'll also have an opportunity to do that at the end of our sermon. Now, talking a little bit more about this aspect of mission work and religious freedom, how do the two combine and go together, right? We as Seventh-day Adventists have, as I mentioned, we've shared the gospel around the world. Uh, if we can look at our next uh, slide, please. Seventh-day Adventist members globally, 
between 18 and 19 million members that we have as of our last general conference. You'll notice on the screen as well, though, Jehovah's Witnesses have between 13 and 14 million. They also engage in aggressive evangelistic work going door to door. Catholics, roughly 1 billion. All Protestant groups, 900 million. And Muslims, 1.8 or 1.9 billion. Now, very soon, the global population is going to reach 7 billion, if we haven't already passed that, I think, uh, here recently. Out of that amount, uh, you might say that out of every seven people you meet globally, there are two of those that are Muslim, statistically wise. Now, I don't have time in this seminar, uh, in this presentation, to go into a, a whole seminar on Islam. Uh, I might do that this afternoon if some of you have an interest in staying by after lunch. Uh, if you do have an interest, uh, in fact, let me do a quick ask uh, right now. If you have an interest in an afternoon presentation, please raise your hand, and that way I can know if, uh, if some of you would like to stay by. Um, maybe 10, 10, 12 people. Okay. As I go through the rest of the presentation this morning, you'll have an opportunity to evaluate uh, what I'm sharing with you, and if you have an interest, there might be a few other people that would like to stay by this afternoon right after lunch. Uh, but anyway, talking about this point of missionary work, we as Seventh-day Adventists use the principle of the golden rule and emphasize religious freedom from the perspective of saying we recognize that the world is made up of a variety of religious groups. And for that reason, just as we would ask other groups to respect our faith and our opportunity to share it with others, we also extend the same to them. And so basically, we engage in interfaith relationships on a global scale with even Muslims. Um, the International Religious Liberty Association, which was founded by Seventh-day Adventists in 1893, is an organization that just uh, three years ago, we helped a Muslim community in Kazakhstan, that's one of the former satellite countries of Russia, they actually, their government there had used a bulldozer and destroyed their mosque. So we as Seventh-day Adventists were at the forefront of engaging their government and talking about the, uh, the human rights that those, that congregation had, uh, speaking about the international human rights uh, through the United Nations, and also the work that we do on a global scale as Seventh-day Adventists. And so we engaged their government and talked about those issues and managed to work and lobby their government to the point that the government uh, actually paid for a rebuilding of their mosque. So those are things that we as Adventists have done in countries around the world, uh, not only defending the rights of Seventh-day Adventists to practice our faith freely, but also the rights of other uh, religious groups, even non-Christians, to, uh, to practice their faith freely. So that is something that has gained us good favor with non-Adventists around the world. They recognize that we respect their rights of conscience and ask that they would do the same for us. So in this area of missionary work, uh, we've got to recognize the fundamental principle of religious freedom that is necessary to share the three angels' messages with countries around the world. For example, there are some of the Islamic countries in the Middle East. If they are, are very heavily dominated by Islam, then they recognize the Islamic faith as the only faith that is to be practiced in that country and all other faiths are prohibited by law, in some cases under the penalty of death. So in those cases, since we're not given an opportunity to share the three angels' messages when we go into those countries, the approach that we as Adventists take is we go into those countries and we offer humanitarian aid. If those people are devastated by some kind of natural disaster, we have our uh, uh, ADRA, the Adventist Development and Relief Agency that goes in to offer humanitarian aid. And as we gain their goodwill and their favor, recognizing that they recognize that we're there to, to help them and not hurt them, then the next thing that we simply do is we share with them the idea of religious freedom, that we defend the rights of Muslims around the world as well as that of Seventh-day Adventists. And as doors open, we have an opportunity to share with them more about Seventh-day Adventism. Our next slide, you'll notice... <clears throat> dealing with Seventh-day Adventist missions. Uh, two angles that we look at it from, from Matthew 28, 19, and 20. That's where Jesus gave us the gospel commission. Go ye therefore into all nations, uh, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the, uh, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 
uh, and also teaching them all things whatsoever I have commanded you. So that is what we call the pure gospel focus. Um, that's where church members engage and they go out as missionaries. Uh, we do missionary work in our communities. The second angle of fulfilling that gospel commission is what you find there in 2 Corinthians 5.19, where Paul says, To wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors of Christ. So the angle that we as Seventh-day Adventists take from a uh, more of a, a general conference level is looking at the idea of spreading the three angels' messages from the diplomatic perspective. And this is where leadership in the general conference, we go into other countries and we engage the leaders of those countries uh, more from a, a diplomatic perspective. For example, we would go into the country of Peru and we would talk with the president of Peru and with their government there, the federal government, and explain to them that what we do as Seventh-day Adventists is not to come into their country to make their, their citizens members of our church. We go into their country to help their citizens become better citizens. And that raises the interest of, of, of civil leaders, and they ask us, so how do you propose to do that? Well, one of the things that we have here is what we call a comprehensive health uh, package. We come in and we give seminars on health topics. We've got doctors like we did in San Antonio this summer uh, before the general conference, doctors that will come in and voluntarily give uh, services to your, your citizens. Well, of course, that interests any government. We go on to share with them about a short health seminar of a week or two that we can give teaching their citizens about basic uh, health care, diet, uh, sim simple home remedies, and so forth. Well, once we've done that, then some other things that we also share with them. We have individuals in our church that are gifted. They can give seminars on financial management, seminars on how to manage stress and depression, etc. Well, once we've started doing that, then we have those governments interested in the work that we're doing to help their citizens become uh, better citizens and live healthier lives. Some of the other things that we go along the way sharing with them after that is that once they start asking us questions about our faith, why are we doing this? You know, simply to help other people. We share with them that we're Christians. We love Christ. We believe that Christ wants all of humanity to enjoy the blessings of good health and prosperity as uh, the Gospel of John tells us, right? In uh, third John, first John, uh, he tells us that. Excuse me, third John, verse two. Uh, he tells that, beloved, above all things, I wish that you would prosper and be in good health. So that gives us an opportunity to share basic Bible principles with those people in those governments. Um, in time, what we have an opportunity to do is people, the people that we help, the citizens there that we help, they start to have an interest in the faith that we believe in. We start giving Bible studies. The next thing you know, we have churches that are planted. And then after that, we have uh, small areas of conferences organized within those countries. And God's work prospers and moves forward. So that is how we, from a diplomatic perspective, use religious freedom to share with people in those other countries, especially with their government leaders, that we're not there to, to threaten their civil order. We're not there to make their citizens Seventh-day Adventists. We believe in the concept of religious freedom. Uh, you know, we share with them, if it's a Catholic country, we let them know that we defend the rights of Catholics in America and around the world. If it's a mu Muslim country, we let them know that we defend the rights of Muslims around the world. Now, I'll, I'll pause a moment and just share this with you. There are some Seventh-day Adventists that have some difficulty with that. Um, I'll just share that with you up front. Um, because what they do is they feel that we're compromising the faith that God has given to us. They feel that we're dropping the standard of the three angels' messages. And some have even gone to an extreme point of saying that just because we have interfaith dialogue with non-Adventist groups, that we as, as the leadership in the General Conference have basically uh, sold out our faith. And they have theories about Jesuits that have infiltrated the church and things like that. Um, part of what I try to do in my seminars is dispel those myths, okay? Um, I don't have time to go into the long process that we as pastors go through in the vetting process before we're assigned to churches, right? Um, and other little checks along the way that we have to find out if somebody's actually teaching uh, heresy and falsehood and, and error in our churches. Um, I think most all of you as Adventist members well know the faith well enough that if somebody is up in the pulpit teaching you something that is not in harmony with the faith, 
little red flags be, should begin to go up in your, your mind and you say, wait a minute, there's something here with what he's saying that doesn't square with the Bible, right? How many of you believe that? Okay. So there's enough checks along the way within our church structure that people, uh, Jesuits, cannot infiltrate the church, okay? If they did happen to do that, they would be identified immediately or soon enough and simply removed. You know, pastors are removed from uh, churches and even removed uh, their ministerial credentials are removed in cases uh, variety for a variety of reasons, but it is something that our conference leadership has the authority to do that. So that's why I try to encourage our churches wherever I go that a lot of the conspiracy theories, uh, infiltration theories, ideas of our church leadership selling out the faith and so forth, those things are bunk, okay? Um, now, I hope that this congregation, uh, that you don't lean in that direction uh, and that you recognize the need to be balanced Seventh-day Adventists, right? Our next slide, please. Moving on to point number two, okay, from Revelation 14, 6 is the Christological focus. Uh, Luke 9, chapter, chapter 9, verses 51 through 56. Uh, you can look it up if you wish. <coughs> I'll share with you briefly what the story is dealing with. This is the last week of Christ's earthly ministry. Now, up to this point, he's gone through a lot of challenges and trials for three and a half years of his public ministry. In Luke chapter 9, verse 51 and 52, the Bible says that Jesus set his face steadfastly to Jerusalem. He was going up there because he knew it was the Passion Week, the last week of his life, and he was headed to Jerusalem. But along the way, he had asked two of his disciples to go ahead of him and stop by in a Samaritan village because he was going to go through the Samaritan village en route to Jerusalem. Well, what the, the, his disciples did is they went there, but the Samaritan village rejected them outright and uh, didn't want anything to do, have anything to do with Jesus. They came back to Jesus and told him this, and they were very indignant. And they said, Master, do you want us to call fire down from heaven to consume that village just like Elijah did? And Jesus paused a moment, and then he gently rebuked them, and he said, You don't know what spirit has possessed you. The Son of Man has come not to destroy men's lives, but to save them. So we find in the example of Jesus that Christ respected the conscience and the convictions of human beings, not just the Samaritans, but in other occasions during his life uh, ministry, he showed that. Uh, the key point that we're getting at here is the Samaritans, by the way, were many years back, um, several hundred years before the time of Christ, the Samaritans at one time had been part of the Jewish faith. Um, way back at the time of the divided kingdom, around 900 B.C., when the kingdom was divided between the ten northern tribes and the, and the two southern tribes, that is where the Samaritans, the Jews, started mingling with the Samaritans and basically became part of that worship system. Uh, they had beliefs that were not completely square with Jew ortho Orthodox Jewish teachings. And you can learn a little bit more about that if you go back and read in John chapter 4 when Jesus dialogued with the woman at the well. She was a Samaritan, and there was a nice, interesting conversation that they had. Short of the point is this. The Samaritans and the Jews hated each other. And yet, when Jesus was wanting to go into a Samaritan village and they rejected him, obviously, him being a Jewish rabbi, Jesus did not concede to what his disciples wanted to do, destroy the Samaritan village. Jesus, Jesus showed respect for their conscientious convictions and moved on and w took a different route to Jerusalem. Now, the thing that we need to dwell on briefly here on a practical level, we as Seventh-day Adventists, I, I hope and pray, we spend enough time with Jesus on a daily basis that the right spirit, the Holy Spirit, possesses us. Because if you bear in mind in this story, in Luke chapter 9, verses 51 through 56, we find that Jesus' disciples had spent three and a half years in the very presence of Christ, and yet they had a spirit of vengeance, a spirit of, of wanting to destroy these people. There are some Christians, and maybe some of you have met some Christians, Adventist and non-Adventist Christians, that have a spirit of could I use the word fire? A fiery temper and, and all of a sudden they explode and you know uh, they will challenge you on something or become 
upset with you about something. Uh, these are things that we need to recognize that Christ's own disciples have. Now, the word of encouragement for those of us that may have a fiery temper. Um, Jesus accepted them and retained them. They remained his disciples with their defects of character because Jesus knew that if they would stay with him long enough, those things would be removed. And they went on to become some of the apostles and the founding leaders in the church during the first century. Amen? Now, there's other disciples as well that had other defects of character and things they needed to grow in as Christians. But again, that's not what our seminar is dealing with right now. So based on this, Jesus showed respect for his disciples uh, and for those that were not of his faith, those that had rejected him. What we need to ask ourselves the question, when I am doing missionary work, when I'm sharing my faith with family members that are not Seventh-day Adventists, or if I'm going door to door and knocking on those doors and giving Bible studies, how do I respond when somebody is either slow to learn the truths I'm trying to teach them, or they're maybe reach a point where they reject it? Do I get upset? Do I try to keep pressuring them, uh, kind of uh, coercing them to accept the faith that I believe and, and hold in my heart? There was one time uh, when I was working in another conference years ago, I was giving a Bible study to a man, and uh, we had gone through seven lessons, and on the seventh lesson, we talked about the Sabbath. I went through and I gave the Bible study to him for about 30 minutes. And at the end of the study, uh, of course, along the way, I asked a few questions. But at the end of the study, I asked him, I said, so what, uh, from what you've learned today, tonight in our Bible study, what day is the Sabbath day? Sunday. I smiled. I said, I said okay, now, what, is, what day is the biblical Sabbath? Sunday. I said, I said, wait a minute, let's go back and let's look at this verse here. So we went back and we looked at some verses again. And so when I asked him again, then he said, Saturday. I said, okay. I said, we went through a few other questions, and I thought I had cleared him on the Sabbath. Okay. The next week, a week later, I went by for Bible study, and we started going into the next lesson dealing with the return of Christ, lesson eight of the Amazing Facts Study Guide. And bef uh, along the ways we were studying that, I asked him again the question. I said, so now that we've learned about the Sabbath being on Saturday, and he said, Sunday. I said, uh, no, I said, no, you remember last week we learned about Saturday being sa the Sabbath. It's on sa Saturday. And he said, no, Sunday. He said, that's the day that I've been going to church for so many years. So we went through three different weeks ever for in, in order. I had to go by and study with him until finally it sunk in and he was able to, to confirm and, and hold to that that Saturday was the biblical Sabbath. So we have to have much patience working with people as they come out of the darkness of error and superstition. Now, one of the other things that we notice, um, and in John chapter 8, verses 1 through 11, uh, you can read verse 9 if you have a moment. Go back and read it on your own. But just very quickly, looking at how Christ dealt with others and their conscience. The religious leaders had brought a woman taken in adultery to Christ. They were trying to entrap him. They cast him, her at his feet. And basically, uh, we're saying that she was worthy of death of being stoned. Jesus ended up saying, those of you that are without sin, let him cast the first stone. And he knelt down and began to write. Uh, many commentators believe that he was writing on the ground of their sins. Uh, because when they came by and, and looked, uh, one by one, they started dropping the stones that they had and they left. Finally, at the end of that, the woman, who very with fear, looked up to Jesus and ended up asking the question, you know, what are you going to do with me? In essence, are you going to stone me? And Jesus said, woman, where are your accusers? She looked and said, they have gone. And he said, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. So the point of this is that in verse 9, the Bible says that those religious leaders were convicted in their conscience. Jesus didn't have to go to their one by one in their face with his finger telling them, you've committed this sin, you've committed this sin. He didn't have to do that. Simply by them observing his demeanor and what he wrote on the ground, they were convicted individually, and that's why they dropped the stones and they left. So what we find then is that Christ works with each of us, speaking to our individual conscience, convicting us. I would venture to say, okay, at this point, I would venture to say that every one of us that are gathered here today, we recognize at some point in our lives when we, in our, in our conscience, in our mind, we've said, my gut feeling is, I know that I should not be doing this without anyone else having to tell us that, right? Okay. 
You don't have to say what your conviction has been. But if you've had that experience, raise your hand. I would say at least half to three-fourths of us, okay? We know when we're, we're convicted of either something we shouldn't be doing or something that we should be doing without somebody needing to tell us that. And that simply comes through prayer, talking with God, reading the Bible, hearing a sermon. God speaks to us in these ways. So Jesus recognizes the sacredness of the human conscience, and that's where religious liberty comes in. <clears throat> this is why we as a Seventh-day Adventist church we do recognize the biblical Sabbath from Friday night, Saturday to Saturday night. Uh, fr from Friday night to Saturday night is the biblical Sabbath. But as far as prescribing how the Sabbath should be observed, that is something that we, we give general guidelines, spending time in nature, coming to church, giving Bible studies, going out on uh, you know, singing groups, going out to nursing homes and so forth. But we don't sit here and prescribe exactly how every member of the church needs to observe the Sabbath because we recognize the principle of freedom of conscience. So those are things that we as Adventists do our best to incorporate the principle of freedom of conscience in all of the teachings that we hold, the 28 fundamental beliefs that we hold as Seventh-day Adventists. Now, applying these things just a little bit, I've talked about personal evangelism within the family unit, okay? Let me share this, and, and it's not my intention, okay? Not my intention to step on toes. Um, I simply share this because I know that these are things, as a pastor, I know that I need to speak on these things on occasion in our churches. There have been times during the course of my pastoral ministry in other churches where, I, as I've gotten to know families, that I find that typically it's the husband in, in a relationship, but not always. Uh, but one of the family members tends to be very dominant, and they're convicted of something, and everybody else in the family needs to do that thing. We need to recognize that God has made each family unit with variety. You know, uh, some of us may love roses, red roses, in fact, and we plant a whole flower bed of just red roses. But there's some of us that like pink lilies and some of us that like white tulips. And so God has made all of these different flowers in the world for variety and to help each of us recognize that's my favorite flower, whereas for somebody else it may be this other thing. Now, on a practical level, there have been some Adventist families that I've gotten acquainted with where they kind of, one person in the family prescribes the diet for everybody and uh, saying this is health reform, these are the things you, everybody needs to do. Um, we need to recognize that there is a bit of flexibility in what God asks us to do and how he, he guidelines he gives us to follow as Seventh-day Adventist Christians. Uh, within the church family, the historical context of 1 Corinthians 8, again, is talking about this idea of conscience, okay? Now, just to give you the quick background to it, uh, there were individuals there in uh, 1 Corinthians, in the tr Corinthian church, that they recognized, that uh, they believed anyway, that food offered in sacrifice to idols was, uh, was an abomination to God, and they did not want to buy it and use it, uh, eat it. They felt that if they bought that food offered in sacrifice to idols, that they were uh, basically dishonoring Christ. <coughs> Paul told them, that those who have strong faith can go ahead and buy the, the meat offered in sacrifice to idols and eat it, and it's nothing that displeases God because they believe there's only one God, Jesus Christ. They, don't, you know, they recognize that even if food is offered in sacrifice to these other idols, these other gods don't exist. That's people with strong faith. People with weak faith, while they believe in God, they still had that troubled conscience saying, if I buy the food that's offered in sacrifice to these other uh, idols and gods, am I not violating my conscience before God and displeasing God? So what Paul did is Paul said, for those that are weak in the faith, those of us that are strong in the faith, we should respect and honor their, their conscience, their weak conscience, even though, even though, and this is the key point, even though they are wrong in their belief, but we need to respect it anyway to show the love of Christ and maintain unity in the church. Now, that's just a quick summary of 1 Corinthians chapter 8. You can go back and read it on your own. Uh, there's a parallel situation in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 where Paul is talking about the same thing, food offered in sacrifice to idols and whether I should eat it or not eat it. Now, quick clarification. Paul is not talking about unclean foods in either of those passages, okay? Uh, historically, he's talking about clean foods, things that were permissible to be eaten, 
by Jews and Christians of the first century, but also those things that had been offered in sacrifice to idols. Now, based on this, putting it in practical terms, applying it here in the church, if you go back and read in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 12, Paul says that the individual who violates the conscience of a weak brother or sister in the faith has not only sinned against that individual, but has sinned against Christ. Now, that's the strong language that Paul uses, not Pastor Cook, okay? Now, what does this mean? God has given us principles of health reform, but not everybody is convicted at the same time, okay? We all don't make the same changes as quickly as others do, okay? For myself personally, as soon as I learned about health reform, it was kind of like just night to day. I left meat out of my diet. Within uh, just a few years later, I left eggs out of my diet and cheese out of my diet milk out of my diet and uh, I nowadays I'm almost I would say for the most part I'm a vegan I mean if I sit down in somebody's home and they've prepared a nice meal of rice with some egg mixed into it I eat it without question okay no problem with that but in my own home and generally practiced uh, when I go out to eat and so forth it's more of a vegan diet um, but again that's for myself personally I don't uh, feel that in my churches I need to obligate all of my members to become vegans or be vegetarians I do encourage them and let them know there's benefits to it, but God has got to convict them and lead their conscience. I cannot be their conscience. So dealing with this idea of Christ's example and religious liberty, we re need to recognize that the principle of religious liberty is something, freedom of conscience, it needs to be practiced in our churches as well. Um, let me throw out one other quick little uh, illustration for you. In one of the churches where I pastored at one time, one of the ladies that was there believed firmly that women should not use, not only not use jewelry, but also should not use makeup. Okay. Now, if you people don't believe that the situations that Jesus faced back in his day don't happen in our day, I would encourage you to take another think about it. Because we as pastors, and your pastor probably could share some things, but I'm not going to put him on the spot. <laughs> but... We as pastors face some very difficult situations at times and very difficult congregations at times. But in that particular church, early Sabbath morning, I got there about 9 o'clock before song service started at 9.15. One of the ladies that was there, very beautiful in personality, warm, loving, and affectionate, she was the greeter, the deaconess in charge, the greeter. She was there. She welcomed me warmly. I felt like I was in my own home. Well, this other lady that had her certain convictions happened to show up within two minutes after that and right in the presence of the deaconess that had greeted me who had some little bit of makeup on, this other lady asked me, Pastor, isn't it true that our church believes in, in the principle of proper adornment? I said, the principle of proper adornment? I said, yes. And then she said, and doesn't that include the fact that women should not use any makeup? Now, she asked me that question right in the presence of this other lady. So you put it together in your mind. What do you think she was trying to do? She was trying to convict this lady that she shouldn't be using makeup. And she was trying to put me on the spot as the one telling her that instead of her doing it. In my terms, she was a coward. Okay. Now, what did I do at that point? As soon as she stated that, I sent up a quick prayer. And here's the unfortunate thing, okay? The Lord saved me from the difficult situation, but at the same time, it was unfortunate that what this other lady, the deaconess, did, she felt so attacked by it, belittled by it, that she started to cry, and she turned around and she left. She went right into the sanctuary. So I didn't have to answer the question of the other lady, but what I ended up doing is I, as a pastor, I followed her right in and I started to console her. Who do you suppose was right behind me? The other lady. Kind of, uh, you know, there's some people that can be uh, <coughs> dogmatic. They get a hold of something and they don't want to let it go and so forth. <coughs> May God help us to not be those kinds of Christians, right? So these are some examples that I'm sharing with you about how this topic of religious liberty and freedom of conscience can actually have a very practical application in our church families. <coughs> Moving on to our next slide. <coughs> the eschatological focus, and this is the third and last point that we're going to look at. 
Uh, Revelation 13, verses 12 through 16, you can go there and read about the second beast that comes up out of the earth uh, that makes an image to the first beast. And basically in doing that, uh, it ends up leading earth's inhabitants to worship the image to the beast and to receive the mark of the beast. In the context of this, what we find is that the Bible does talk about the idea of persecution that will happen or take place in the end of time. Uh, the term eschatological is a study of last day events. Now, what is interesting, though, is we as Seventh-day Adventists in our his history did not have the understanding that we have today way back at the beginning, back in the 1840s, 1850s, 1860s. Uh, you can see there on the chart I've listed some basic things as far as an, a theological development of Adventism. 1844, the Sanctuary Truth. 1848, the Sabbath Truth. The 1850s, Health Reform. 1863, we adopted the official name Seventh-day Adventist. Early pioneers were kind of concerned about the idea of organizing into an official capacity, and they felt that we would be following in the, pa uh, the pathway of Rome, the Roman Catholic Church, if we were to do that. But God gave clear vision to Ellen White, as well as our pioneers studying the Bible, and we recognized the need to have an official organization. Uh, 1870s, 1880s, there were eschatological events uh, that started taking place leading up to 1888 and 1892, the Sunday Law. So it was during the 1870s and 1880s that we hammered out and formulated a clear understanding <coughs> of Bible doctrine regarding last day events, regarding the beast of Revelation 13, uh, the second beast of Revelation 13, the beast of Daniel, the little horn of Daniel 7, and so forth. <coughs> in 1892, uh, that led to the International Religious Liberty Association being organized by our church to defend, promote, and proclaim the concept of religious freedom, not only for Seventh-day Adventists, but for people of all faiths, whose ways are nonviolent, by the way. Now, uh, I share these things with you to help us understand that in Revelation 14, 6, there are three key things, uh, we could say principles, dealing with religious freedom that integrally relates religious freedom to the proclamation of the three angels' messages. And I've shared those with you today, dealing with the missiological focus, dealing with the Christological focus, and dealing with the eschatological focus. So those are three things that are foundational principles or bedrocks of uh, the work that we do as Seventh-day Adventists and how religious freedom is directly related to the proclamation of the three angels' messages. Our last slide. These are some websites you can go to, uh, libertymagazine.org. If you will look under the author archive, click on that, and then you look under the two different names. Uh, I don't have two names, by the way, but they made a mistake, and they put Edwin Cook and Edwin C. Cook as two different authors. But if you click on either of those, you'll find articles that I have written for Liberty Magazine. Those are freebies, by the way. Uh, you can access them on the Internet. You don't have to pay for those. Uh, my website is l21c.com. If you click on media and click on articles, it'll take you to those same linked articles. You can go to religiouslibertyinfo.com, which is the North American Religious Liberty Association website. Uh, there's a lot of good resources in and info there that you can uh, access on the internet, uh, as well as contacting me. Um, you should have gotten a card on your way in that had my contact info on it. If you didn't, you can still pick one up on the way out um, that gives you your contact info of how you can get in touch with me. Um, I don't have time to give you an opportunity for questions. Um, those of you that stay by after lunch, if you have questions, you can ask then. But uh, with God's blessings, I hope that this has been informative uh, for all of us and has been something to help us understand a little bit more about religious freedom and how freedom of conscience is something that is integral to God's character and to, to the work that we do as Seventh-day Adventists. And at this time, uh, I believe our closing hymn, we've got, uh, is it our choir that's going to sing for us? Our song leader. <laughs>